Hi, okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the session indeed about p-hacking uh, and a bit more even. Uh, we have um, made a symposium um, in which we wanted to revisit uh, questionable research practices a bit. And with that, I mean that um, a lot of research has already been done on questionable research practices on p-hacking. Um, we wanted to give it a bit of a twist. We will be talking about multiverse analysis um, we will present SAM, which is a very exciting program, and I don't want to spoil too much. Um, we are going to talk um, about the theoretical model of p-hacking, and um, finally, I'm going to present some results on um, a simulation study conducted in SAM. We're going to need all the time that we need, so um, I'm going to uh, start real quick. Our first speaker uh, would be Anton olson Collentine, but uh, unfortunately, he could not be here today. Luckily, our other speaker, Jelte Wichertz, will... Um, uh, take over and will present in his place. Um, without further ado, uh, I present to you Professor Jelte Wichertz. Um, have fun, enjoy. Yes, and I'm, uh, I'm live. Thank you, Esther, for introducing us. Uh, unfortunately, Anton fell ill, but uh, having been involved as a supervisor in this project, which I like a lot, uh, I think I'm in quite a good position to present it. So it's about uh, multiverse analysis that makes use of uh, pretty cool data from the registered uh, replication reports in uh, psychology. And the whole aim of the project is to get a sense of uh, what p-hacking might look like. The, um, Preprint is on Psych Archive, link given below. And also uh, we'll tweet about it, obviously. So if you ever want to find it, it's uh, not too hard to find. As you might know, uh, in, in many studies, if not all, I would contend, uh, would the data lend itself to a great deal of many analyses. Um, and we call this, after uh, Simmons and his colleagues, uh, degrees of freedom in analysis. Um, the analysis, uh, one would say, is not carved in stone, and actually uh, you could carve quite a few holes in any stone um, through the analysis, and this is called a multiverse analysis. And what we will do here is to see, okay, what does it look like if you analyze the data in a many, many ways, uh, and to see what effect it has on a meta-analytic uh, outcome. So this is the, the Garden of Forking Paths, uh, Gelman and Loken's idea, it's uh, of course by this audience are well known that um, uh, many, many different ways uh, that you can analyze data with uh, could result in many, many different outcomes. And that um, uh, yeah, the call for uh, prior uh, registration of the analytic plan uh, is one way to specify one single path down the garden. Um, and that, um, um, these register application reports in psychology and other fields, I guess, as well, really aim to, uh, to pick a, a seminal study. Uh, they are registered reports, so they're all uh, assessed prior to the study itself. Uh, a very strict protocol is then implemented, and, and the study is run in multiple labs. And this is nice because now we have an awful lot of data, thanks to the hard efforts of all these uh, contributing labs and the leading groups that uh, set, it, set these registered reports up. Uh, and the idea is to see what happens. Now, what we did, what Anton did actually, after he uh, got hold of all the data, uh, is to look at um, um, all sorts of additional information in the data files um, and uh, have a pretty broad protocol uh, that allows you to create different uh, choices in the analysis. So the, the, the slide here is not meant as an eye test, um, but uh, I can tell you uh, that these things uh, relate to a paper we re we've uh, written a couple of years ago on the many types of degrees of freedom that you can actually have in these types of studies. And these types of studies are typically lab studies, relatively short, where uh, the outcome is, is uh, typically at a um, um, the, between group difference in mean, so standardized uh, mean difference is the outcome. Um, and, and the degrees of freedom could be anything. So something like uh, the age is recorded. And if you read uh, in the literature, and this is how also we set up the many different degrees of freedom that you could think of. Um, if you read the literature, you often see uh, we discarded participants aged 25 and above. 
Um, but you can also read sometimes, and actually uh, we have some work on this um, dating some time ago, that they would uh, exclude some outliers on, on particular bases, that they would exclude uh, uh, those who have a, a different uh, native uh, language or, or non-native speakers, that they would uh, uh, also look at the outcome variable, which is often measured by skills, kick out some items from the skill and rerun the analysis. Um, now, you can do that in many, many different ways. And, and it's a protocol that uh, Anton applied, automated, and, and um, used for all these um, labs within the different uh, registered uh, replication reports. And what you can then do is you have a grid, basically, that's the uh, uh, idea from the Belgian group. And it's called then the multiverse because you combine all the different uh, dimensions. Um, so this is one example. Uh, you exclude based on age. Uh, most of the studies are actually student uh, samples. So then the 25 is, is not that too far fetched. And actually, if you use that as a threshold, kick out uh, over 25, you already get two options eh? all cases or those without, uh, with younger ages. But you could also use other completely arbitrary uh, uh, cutoffs. Now, we had a list of uh, very common degrees of freedom, and we, we contend that these can be applied. They were pretty successful in all these labs, uh, lab studies. Uh, and, and a list of more uh, idiosyncratic uh, degrees of freedom that were really well tailored and one would say more subjective and applied to the specific study at hand. So uh, sometimes particular tasks were used. And, and this is also very common in literature that people were, uh, the, the participants were dropped out from the analysis because they didn't do well in the particular tasks. Again, lending itself you know, to different thresholds or criteria. So then uh, this is one of the uh, labs from the RR4. It's all in the paper, which one that is. It's not of interest now, but it's quite representative of, uh, of what you would, the different outcomes. So this is a standardized mean difference that you could obtain uh, when you go through all the possible uh, options to analyze the data. Of course, assuming that these are all uh, arbitrary choices. Eh? That you could uh, criticize, criticize for us I guess uh, to say that this is not a wise choice, but uh, yes, that's uh, that's a good scientific debate, I guess. In this case, uh, 20,000 possible outcomes depicted here, and they depicted uh, in a way that you would recognize uh, having done meta-analysis. So you see that some go up and down, reflecting the discarding of cases. Others go uh, and move horizontally, which might be related to uh, cases where the outcome measure changed. Uh, and over the nine different uh, projects, so these are different topics uh, of interest, uh, we found between 4,000 and 1.5 million multiverses for different studies. So that's quite a lot of options, eh? a lot of uh, ways to find significant results, if you will. Now, uh, and this has been done before in other contexts as well, uh, by Pato and uh, Emilius, for instance, uh, they call it vibration of effects. And uh, of course, um, um, the, the group in, uh, in Leuven did this also, they came up with the idea. And we, we now have seen about 40 or so of these multiverse analyses in the literature. Um, but that's not uh, what is nice about this data. The, the nice thing about these data is that we actually um, have multiple labs running the same experiment. So it's also nice to see, okay, which of the different degrees of freedom, which is the different choices you can implement, make a difference and how much variation we observe. Um, now, in, in what we call p-hacking, I would, I would say it's, it's basically just a selective me selection mechanism. Uh, so what you do then as a p-hacker is just select a, a, one of those that's typically read in paper, maybe two, you know, add a footnote there as a sensitivity analysis to, to shine, the, shine the results up or whatever. But no way that you're going to report this, uh, EI, uh, all the results. Uh, and of course, in this case, and this, 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 if you look at the whole bunch of, of blobs here, I wouldn't say it's a big effect. Uh, and then you could, of course, select uh, among all the significant ones, uh, leading to clear bias. Now, we know that these are actually registered reports. So we know that, that one of those dots were actually, was actually chosen by the, uh, in the protocol, that uh, there in the actuality would not be a bias of this sort. But had these studies not been pre-registered, we could actually see how much bias they might have caused um, over different labs uh, if the same study had been run. And the researcher had all the, the options to choose. So p-hacking would be something like you, you, you pick something and it could be, you know, uh, 
completely random. Who knows? You could uh, you could yeah, imagine all sorts of psychological biases playing a role. Hindsight bias is nice. I, I knew it all along. In fact, it's a very potent thing that even us as a group, uh, you know, we pre-registering our studies uh, even fall prey off. Huh? So then uh, had some nice project of one of the PhD students and. You know, as we pre-registered and then and we found some really cool results and I was really enthusiastic about it. And I was, I could, you know, definitely, I was, I was absolutely certain that this is what we had pre-registered. No way. So anyway, hindsight biases is a very strong bias as a other biases like confirmation bias. Now, intentional would be some, some selection based on the data, which causes bias. So this is one RRR and then you see the 16 labs here. And, and this is the same study, yeah? running different labs. So you can imagine some differences here in the end, which is uh, obvious because the, 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 the scatter plots are upper, higher or lower in the funnel, uh, reflecting lower or bigger, uh, smaller or larger sample sizes. And you could imagine also that some pick, you know, uh, an effect uh, to their interest on the right-hand side, others on the left, getting, uh, giving rise to all sorts of uh, confusion in the literature. Had these studies not been pre-registered. Now, the nice thing about this, as I said, uh, this uses a protocol that structures the degrees of freedom, the grid search, if you will. So this is then uh, an overview of the different um, degrees of freedom, different choices that one could make, to, so that's the marginal dimension, to see how much variation in the outcomes they actually cause. So for instance, uh, in lab seven, it's the percent. It's select deselecting people on on some uh, error percentage correct on some of the test that yields a lot of uh, variation in fact size. This makes a big difference. Other labs like uh, lab nine on the left hand side, first column, uh, their age had a major influence. So age moderated the fact, or at least you would say naively. Uh, it's probably just random sampling anyway given the inconsistency of all these patterns over all these different labs using the same protocol, running basically the same study. So um, there is bias, that's one message, uh, but also the bias is very unstructured and, and looks like it's going in all sorts of directions, which is quite uh, dis discomforting for those of us who would one day would like to correct for these biases, uh, either in individual studies or in meta-analyses. So it's a mess. Another important uh, 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 thing that we, well, not really uncovered, but that you can recognize here, you can also do it formally, is that if you look at uh, one, one, if you look at multiverse that have the same sample size, uh, now given this, 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 uh, the confidence interval width in this funnel, we would expect if this were independent draws, you know, that the, the blobs would be uh, mostly around the 95% confidence interval. Um, and they're not, and they're much narrower. Now this makes perfect sense because you're using the same data. So there's highly correlated data. So what you would ex expect under no true moderation, so the effect is not actually moderated, but it's just random uh, resampling uh, that uh, given that there's some positive sampling covariance between the outcomes because there's widely overlapping data typically positively correlated, that the standard, that the, the variance, or sorry, the variance or the standard deviation over multiverses would also always be smaller than the, the, the nominal standard error. So that's an important insight. It basically means that uh, uh, p-hacking has less of an in effect than, than it, you would expect under a, a extreme levels of provocation bias. And actually this is, uh, I, I hope that's also in the slide of later uh, talks uh, by Esther. Anyway, I don't have much time, I think. Let's check. Okay, I'm going to be quick on this. What happens in a meta-analysis? Well, it depends on how people select. Huh? So this is the typical meta-analysis uh, combining all these different effects. Um, and, and the blue one here is the pre-registered one. Uh, that's what, what, what would become uh, enlisted in a meta-analysis across different studies. And the, uh, the nice one on the right is the most significant one. So it's the mo most extreme scenario you can imagine of selection among all the multiverses in, in all those studies. And this is a slide that I think, I think I'm gonna just stick with this one. This is in the paper. This is for all local ratios in two of the uh, registered application reports. So this is a meta-analytic outcome that 
depends on basically what people select from the multiverse. And you see the blue one here, and that's actually the pre-registered outcome. So what he, what's done here, it's, we run a meta-analysis on only the pre-registered outcomes. And the other ones that are uh, shifted to the right, reflecting bias, are different selection mechanisms. So you can pick, you know, the most significant one. You can pick randomly among all the significant ones. It might reflect, you know, if you're not uh, running all of the multiverses, but rather some haphazard, uh, you know, walk, random walk through the, the forest, if you will, just the first one that will be significant or maybe the least significant one. There's also this blob in the middle that's actually the average of our own multiverses. Uh, and the nice thing about uh, this and the next slide is actually that what we found is that, um, yes, there will be bias if there's selection, and it might be more extreme if you pick the most significant, obviously, um, based on significance. But the pre-registered outcomes are actually quite close to the mean. And this is also picked in a smaller slide here for standardized mean difference, the mean overall multiverses. There's only two, I think, there's only one, that's RR3, well, one of the outcome measures on top, where the mean of the multiverses is not very close to the pre-registered outcome. So in a way, they, they picked something that's weird, at least quite outside of the range of the other multiverses. But for all the others, uh, the mean overall multiverses is quite close to the effect uh, that was pre-registered. So degrees of freedom matter. They create a lot of uncertainty, absolutely, with, with quite complex statistical properties, as you can imagine, that also very de deviate a lot between different studies, uh, even if the studies are very similar. Uh, without pre-registration, there's no, no, no way of knowing what's going on, so the, the, the potential for bias is massive, and the selection is what matters most. Um, and as said, um, here at least, but it's a selected sample, right? The RRRs, most of them actually didn't show a big effect anyway. Uh, there were field applications, if you will, um, at least according to some. Uh, I would I think they're very successful um, in estimating the real effect. Uh, but um, here, at least, the, the average of the multiverses look very close to the mean, uh, to the pre registered outcomes. So thanks also on behalf of uh, Anton, and we wish him well. Quick recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yelta. Um, we have time. Uh, I saw there were two questions already in the Q&A chat. Uh, maybe someone else wants to ask a question. Uh, we have a bit of time for that. Uh, and otherwise, Yelta, I would uh, ask if you open the Q&A uh, and answer a question. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So first one is by chat. The heat map is shown around slide five, or the count of point estimates, correct? Wouldn't reporting an interval estimate from one analysis adequately represent the effect? Yes, if it if the points would be independent draws, which are definitely not. So that's uh, related to the the uh, insight that if you p-hack, you would have positively overlapping data. So the standard error would also always be bigger in that case than the standard deviation over multiverses. Uh, Brian also has a question. Um, excellent project. Oh, thank you. Have you tried emulating the original finding through replication process by, for example, selecting an analysis strategy that worked from one lab and using that same analysis strategy to directly replicate the finding in the other nine labs? So that's a cool, cool effort as well, right? So you see, uh, indeed, uh, in, in actual research in psychology that they just mimic uh, what others do. So that might be, you know, the seminal study uses this, this haphazard choice for the outcome measure and some haphazard choice, you know, um, um, that would um, you know, mean that they, they, they dropped all the, the oldies uh, over 25. I can say that I'm 45 since two days. Anyway, um, that, um, and then uh, they, they, just, they just mimic the same. So they would call it a direct replication in that sense. Uh, now, the variation over the labs that we observed in one of the slides I showed you in, in the degree to which different degrees of freedom and different choices make a difference over labs is, is quite substantial. So I don't think it will gonna matter much. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a potpourri of uh, nicely smelling uh, weird results that we don't really understand. Huh? So thank, thank you for those questions. I hope they answered them. Yes. Uh, thanks, Yalta. Thank you very much. Um, 
I'm uh, quickly going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Amir Abdol. He um, designed, uh, programmed um, a wonderful program um, uh, of which I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, I saw his presentation earlier. It's going to be very clear and it's going to be very exciting. So um, Amir, please take it away. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I hope everyone hears me. As uh, Esther said, uh, I'm Amir. I am uh, postdoc at Tilburg University and, and also jazz programmer at the University of Amsterdam. So now I'm going to introduce Sam to you. Sam is a software we developed to simulate an abstract model of uh, uh, producing a science and publishing science. So this is abstract. So I'm going to take everything Yelta showed in practice, and I'm going to really make it abstract how the science is done and how we could do it in a computer. And we are not trying to simulate everything one by one. We try to get close as close as we can. So I'm going to start by why, and then go through uh, what Sam is, give you a bit more introduction and detail about different pieces that Sam has and allows you to do uh, to make your own simulation. And then we're gonna review and tell you how you'd use it and what are the stuff that you could do with it. <laughs> so uh, I'm coming from a, a complex system computational science background. So when I look at the system um, I, that I want to study, I want to know all these components. I want to understand all these pieces uh, to be able to, uh, uh, really understand what's going on, I want to know how these pieces are interacting with each other and I want to know how they coexist. And if I remove one, if I modify one, what will happen? And when I look at the, when first I look at this uh, whole problem of QRPs, degrees of freedom and publication bias, my brain was just that there's just too much stuff here and there is so little data. So what do we do? Uh, since I'm coming from computation, so let's write a simulator. So that's what we did. Uh, I started to make a uh, SAM, and as you can see, I define it as a modular, flexible, and extensible simulator to systematically study questionable research practices. There are three keywords here uh, that I would like to point out. One is modular, the other one flexible, and extensible. Uh, modularity allows us to understand the underlying component and processes. What that means is that if Think about it, so I'm gonna use a car analogy here. Think about a car. If uh, you want to change the wheel in your car, the tires, if you know that your car has a 16 inch tire, you could use another 16 inch tire and see what effect it has on the torque and the acceleration and whatnot. So that's modularity. As long as they fit, you move them around without any confusion and they work. Flexibility means that you have a precise uh, control over customization of each component. So again, think about the wheel, you could precisely measure and uh, change the uh, air pressure and see what that, uh, does, uh, that does. And extensibility means that there's always room for you to add new methods and processes. So this is a general overview of SAM. And what SAM tries to do is try to simulate the process of uh, conducting a research and publishing a research. So if you look at like one overview of how this research is done, it has two main player. So these are simplified. There's a lot more stuff we have in our preprint on the website, but I'm trying to simplify and give you an overview. So there are two main players. There is one researcher and the other one is journal. And in our setup, we have three different processes. We have preparing, performing, and publishing. So how it works is that the researcher uh, think about what it wants to do. Okay, I, ha I have this experiment, and these are the parameters of the experiment. This, the population is this, I'm gonna have uh, two groups of people, and I'm gonna give them this treatment and see what happens. And based on those uh, information, he performs the research and uh, prepare the experiment, collecting data. Then he analyzes it. And if he's happy with the anal analysis, uh, he prepare a manuscript, and then we go to the publishing phase that he passes the manuscript to the publisher, uh, the journal. A journal look at the manuscript that is coming and try to evaluate it with certain factor that it has. Like it could look at the, if it, in the case, very basic case, is it significant or not? And uh, if, it's, if it's happy with the manuscript, it publishes it and it turns into a publication. That's, that's a very abstract uh, overview of how 
research is being conducted. Now I'm gonna move into all these pieces one by one and go to their sub pieces to see what, what are they uh, composed of. And as we start to add more pieces and more pieces, I'm hopeful that it makes sense that um, that modularity that they explain it start to show itself and uh, you could see how they come all together. So if you look at the, if you zoom out a bit um, more, then you will see that the experiment contains the experiment setup. It, uh, the experiment setup, these are the term that I'm using. Don't try to translate them one by one to what you know, but they will make sense. So data strategy, and I go through them later. So experiment setup contains data strategy, test strategy, effective strategy. Think of experiment setup as pre-registration. You say, I'm gonna have two group, this kind of treatment, and my population is gonna be that. And I'm gonna run this test, and I'm gonna calculate the effect like that. And then you collect some data. This will be your experiment. Then the researcher has access to the experiment. It runs it. It has some sort of strategy how he wants to analyze the data and how he wants to prepare his manuscript, right? And sometimes the researcher is um, mischievous, so it's just like, oh, it goes always for the significance. So we could tweak these in the research strategy. And then we have set of hacking strategies, like methods that the researcher might choose or might not choose. We could choose and define if researcher wants to do this or not. And when the research and analysis is done, he prepares the manuscript, he chooses a journal, uh, pass the manuscript to the journal, journal reviews it. And uh, I put a piece meta-analysis here. It comes together later why it's there. And uh, after that, uh, there is the result, the manuscript is accepted, then we have a set of publication, right? Now I'm gonna dive even deeper into in any of these and show you more, more and more pieces. Think about the modularity. I'm trying to break down the process of conducting a research as much as we could. So let's look at the experiment. Experiment has design parameters. So there are two groups, there are certain number of DVs, there are certain number of uh, condition, and there is certain amount of data. Then we have data strategies. That's if that defines uh, how the, uh, where the data comes from. Is it coming from a fixed model? Is it coming from a random effect? Is it coming from a graded response model or any IRT models or whatnot? And uh, these are the pieces that I could all put into the sun. And then we have uh, tested strategies. How this experiment that I'm running is gonna be tested. Uh, how I'm gonna validate if the result is uh, valid or not, how they're significant or not. There are a few tests that we implemented. But remember, I mentioned it's extensible, so we could always add more. We could fine tune uh, these because we are flexible and we could interchange them. And then we have effective strategy, a few other options here. And then I'm gonna move to the researcher. So we know that the hard part is usually the researcher because researcher is the one that think. And when people think, things get hard. So uh, we have experiment that researcher take controls of. And then we have the researcher strategy. He always have, or she always have some sort of plan. I'm gonna run this test like that. I'm gonna run this analysis like that. And then I'm gonna make certain decisions. And so he could make several decisions. Some are listed here. There are more, there are logical queries that you could tell the researcher, okay, when you run your study first and collect the initial type of data, Make, look at your data, choose, for instance, the pre-registered result and make a decision if you're happy for, uh, with it or not. If you're not, maybe you want to run some of the hacking. So think we are trying to think about the fact that we are trying to simulate a specific path. So we have certain decision to make in certain position in during the research. We could even do one decision at all the end after, before the submission. The researcher does everything does it, uh, and then when everything is prepared, look at the manuscript. And I was like, am I really happy with this or not? And then you could define a specific criteria and the researcher, no, not really, so pass it by. And there are several hacking strategies we have implemented. The Some common one, selected reporting, optional stopping, outlier removal, optional dropping, group pooling, question per rounding. And you could have uh, anything here or you could implement more and you can fine tune these to your preferences. We understand that there's no consensus on what these uh, are exactly, uh, but there are a lot of parameters to get to, uh, to the behavior that you would like. And after 
the analysis is done, we have the manuscript, which is just a piece of document that the researcher passes it to the journal. So this is about the researcher. We go one level deeper. And at the end, we have the journal. So journal is uh, equipped with a review strategy. So he the journal has to decide how he is going to process an, an incoming manuscript. We know that there are several criteria. It goes to the reviewer. There are several criteria that each reviewer has. Uh, we could have a journal that uh, free select everything. Everything goes through. We could have a journal that randomly selects things because we want to see what effect that has. We could define a journal that select based on the significance. So we induce some publication bias. We could define a journal that has a custom policy. So if we say, uh, look at the effect, if effect is medium and is significant and the researcher is that guy, accept it, if not just reject everything. Uh, or we could have something like adaptive review strategy that journal look at this uh, uh, continuously update a certain metric on the track of research that it has, let's say always calculate the Eger test and try to somewhat keep the funnel plot uh, symmetric, symmetric. So if most of the results on the right side try to give a bit more weight to those that are on the left side to make the symmetry working a bit better. So kind of keep the pool of publication somewhat stable. Uh, so we have control over how to define the review strategy. We have control over what the journal could calculate during this process and export to us when you want to analysis, uh, analyze uh, the data. And uh, we also have a bunch of publications that journal uh, collected based on these strategies and the simulation that is already running behavior of the researcher. At the end, everything is going to be into this pool of publication that we could take and do more analysis with. So, uh, that was all the pieces. And now there's a lot more going on here, but I want to give you a bit of very high level overview of how these processes uh, um, implemented in SAM. There are different processes that I'm missing here, but this is just a very high level overview. We initialize the experiment setup. These are the parameters that we put. We generate an experiment, then we pass it to the researcher. And we also define all the selection and decision that we want the researcher to make. So the experiment is clean. The researcher looks at it, makes a specific selection, let's say picks the pre-registered result outcome and make a decision. Uh, am I happy with this or do, you, do I want to hack? I, I use hack, it's a bit of a strong word, but you get, the, uh, uh, you get what I mean. It's basically some sort of p hacking. Am I happy with this or not? If he's not happy and wants to hack, then it goes to this stage as, uh, I ask itself again, do I really want to do this? You could define the parameters. And um, when uh, he actually decides to do the hacking, it goes through a loop of hacking strategies that we define, could stack up on top of each other, could pick up a new fresh experiment, uh, edit that, and at the end, collect all those results. And at the end of all the hacking strategies and adventure, look at all those pool, select the one that he thinks is the best, and ruins the entire science and publish it and send it to journal. And journal could look at it and see if it wants it or not. And if it's significant, probably wants it. So uh, this is a very high level overview of what's happening. There are much more, um, much uh, many more processes that you could uh, adjust. And now I'm gonna show you how you could do it. Um, Sam at, uh, is a C++ simulator, which means that you could use it in two way in our case. You could use it by uh, inputting a specific uh, input file, the configuration file, or you could use it uh, as a C++ program and integrate it into any other program, let's say any evolutionary algorithm program that you have, use it as an agent-based simulation framework. Uh, there, how the configuration file looks like, so we have experiment parameters, uh, I don't want you to really read everything. I just want you to know how you put the, put the pieces that I mentioned together. So you define the condition, you define the dependent variable, you define the number of observation, and uh, you have your data strategy, let's say linear model, you give it a, a multivariate normal, you define the mean, you define the sigma, then you define your effective strategy, then you define your test strategy. As you see, there are a lot of parameters to tune. Then you define your selection strategy or research researcher strategy, how to navigate through these uh, 
uh, path of uh, selection that you have through different stages of a simulation. And um, then you define the probability of being a hacker. You could have a random variable there. You could define a series of hacking strategies, how you want them to be applied, in what order you want to, them to be applied, and what kind of parameters you want them to have, when to stop, when to go to the next one, after you're done, what to select and what to report. So you have control over all these details. And at the end, you define the journal. Let's say, run the simulation, collect 14 uh, maximum uh, publication based on significant and induce 95% of publication bias. And what you get at the end is uh, an output file, let's say a CSV file, that is being generated based on the setting that you have. And you could analyze it further to see what kind of biases has been induced to your publication pool. So if you choose to use the uh, uh, configuration file, we have this tiny tool called Frodo, and that helps you to generate these files, configure uh, your projects, uh, manage your SAMS project, and even helps you to run your project in parallel in supercomputer. Uh, so that's Frodo, and that's how you do it. And so I'm going to recap here and then show you, uh, like, uh, give you some point, what could you do with SAM? So as I said, SAM is a modular, flexible, and extensible. Modular because we could, because we could change the stuff uh, very easily and the whole structure of the program stays the same. You don't, we don't need to worry uh, if they work or not, they always work. It's flexible because we have very precise control over the parameters of each module. And it's extensible because we could extend it later. So if someone later wants to, apply some uh, Bayesian data analysis or Bayesian publication bias measure at the end of at the journal side, it could do it. If, it want, if it's a physicist and want to have some fuzzy logic, it could have some fuzzy logic too. That's just possible. Uh, so it's a simulation framework for systematically studying researchers' questionable research practices, as well as uh, journals' questionable reviewing practices. Because we are able to design a specific selection uh, mechanism for the journal, we could define different policies for journals, journal to uh, review incoming manuscript that, is, uh, that has been passed by the researcher. To so then we could actually understand what the journal does to some extent at, at, at abstraction, and maybe try to find out a different way for journal to select things that doesn't ruin us. And with that, I'm going to give you, since there's too much here, I'm going to give you a few examples of what are the stuff that you could do with SAM. So we could do uh, study publication bias and publication bi uh, bias metrics. Met metrics. We could study question of research practices, uh, their individual and collective effects. And uh, we could do multiverse simulation and analysis. You could also include the QRPs and publication bias in those because they're just different modules. You could, we could do meta-meta analysis simulation, again, with all those above. And we could design an experiment with general reviewing policies, as I mentioned. We could design and uh, ev uh, evaluate different researcher strategies. Like if we know how researcher think, then maybe we could simulate a uh, different pathway and uh, tell them, okay, maybe if you think about this this way, it might not have been as uh, detrimental at the end. And we could do combination of all above. And as I uh, mentioned, it's uh, modular. We could do, uh, as it's extensible, we could just add some other new method that we just find and see how that affects uh, the whole system. And with that, I would like to thank you. There's a lot, <laughs> and I talk too much and too fast probably, but I hope you at least get a gist of what Sam is and what it uh, could do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir. We just received a question in the Q&A. I hope you can open it. Yes. Um, uh, I see one from, yeah. Uh, interesting to hear more on what Sam's output file would look like. So you get an, uh, several CSV file based on uh, the parameters that you define. You could ask Sam to report all the publications that has been accepted, all the rejected publication, um, and that includes a lot, uh, several statistics like the effect, p-values, uh, number of observation. If there there is indication if the study has been hacked, is the uh, 
and what is uh, what degrees of, of what dependent variable has been reported and uh, a lot more. If you in, if you define any meta analysis, you get some output of that meta analysis calculation. Um, can you evaluate the biases in published results with this? Uh, I'm not so sure if I understand the question correctly. Uh, like, what do you mean by that? Um, in the interest of time, I'm uh, going to ask uh, the person who asked the question to um, redefine the question again and post it in the Q&A um, because we have to move on. Uh, thank you, Amir, so much for your talk. Thank you. And I'm going to have a quick look at Yelta, whether he is ready already. And he's back by popular yeah. demand. Um, I'm going to give the floor to you again. Professor thank you. I think, uh, I think, can I share? Uh, I think I'm here to stop sharing. Now I can share. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, here I'm again. So now I'm going to show you a typical example of what you could do with Sam. Um, and well, um, it's not even close to what it is capable of. So that's uh, that's cool. Uh, so it's a bit of a, uh, a teaser, if you will. Anyway, the um, the the focus of this ana analysis is actually it's a replication of an earlier study by Marianne Bakker and me, dating always uh, almost nine years ago, where we looked at um, these different biases in in one particular context. Again, focusing a lot on one psychology types of scenarios that will be of interest there. Uh, but yeah, you know, can imagine that these will be relevant uh, more broadly as well. And the focus of the question running this in Sam was, okay, can p-hackers also cheat their way through a lowered alpha level? Um, as said, there are many degrees of freedom. This is the paper I alluded to earlier. Uh, for psychology studies, so this is a typical study where shortly after experiment, um, we in the group, in the medical group in Tilburg sat down at one time and just uh, you know, had a brainstorm session to make a list, which is published in this article, the, how many degrees of freedom you could actually observe. So the many choices we could make, and this was actually the basis of uh, many of the degrees of freedom in the multiverse uh, project by Anton is also actually used in uh, checking pre-registrations uh, by Marianne again in the group, and uh, also Olmo who's gonna talk about that uh, as you hear my five-year-old uh, uh, next week. Um, now, many ways to analyze the data mean many ways to reach the star. So what happens if you lower that alpha to 0 0.005? Now, this is the paper uh, we tried to replicate, uh, which was not, yeah, which was doable, <laughs> which is also an interesting uh, exercise, as you can imagine. Um, it started actually uh, Marianne's recognition that there's a power paradox in psychology as, as it is in many other fields is that many researchers actually continue to use very small underpowered samples. Uh, notwithstanding that, they actually report an awful lot of uh, significant uh, results, uh, arguably over 90%, even higher, uh, according to some very old estimates. Uh, and that cannot be true. And actually, Marianne in this paper estimated the, the average or median power uh, based on, on earlier meta-analyses meta uh, in psychology studies that, that appeared in meta-analyses to be around 0.35. So one third chance getting significant, 90% significant in the reported results. No way that this can be true. Nice thing to notice that this 0.35 was quite well uh, corroborated into other major meta meta analysis later. So anyway, it cannot be true. That's the main essence. And how come this researcher actually continue to use small samples? Uh, and the reason is that's actually the focus of that uh, study by Marianne. Uh, that, that actually using small samples, multiple small samples instead of a large one, is a very effective strategy to get a significant results, particularly when the effect sizes are small or non-existent. And of course, they would also use some of these p-hacking tricks or questionable research practices as we used them, uh, as, as we used the term earlier. So this, this is what it looks like, a eh? plant analysis, significant, okay, effect, right paper, if not, well, maybe you can redo the analysis with some alternative uh, outcome variable. This is called uh, selective outcome reporting, outcome switching, well-established uh, in the medical sciences for randomized control trials, um, you, because they were pre-registered, we know. And it's very easy to do, and actually 63% or so of uh, 
researchers in psychology according to anonymous surveys admit to having used this trick uh, at some point in their career. Uh, you can also add some cases, this is called optional stopping, sequential testing would of, of course need to, you know, change your um, statistical procedure to accommodate that, uh, models for this, but those uh, are not used normally. I don't think at all actually, well sometimes, but hardly. Again, you can also, you know, remove some outliers uh, at some uh, particular criteria. If that's then significant, you're again, you know, in a happy camper. If not, then you say it's a field study and re re resort the study to the file tour. Many, many different ways, many different paths. And there's actually an important point there because this is one sequence that was actually um, simulated in Marianne's paper. Um, but you can also imagine many different sequences and they make a difference. They might make a difference uh, at times. And it's actually what we also enc encountered uh, when uh, Amir, uh, the PM year, but um, uh, uh, replicated that in uh, Sam. So then the first thing is that this is the, your, you know, your road to, route to success in a world where significance matters and there's scarcity of resources and um, journals love significance with, uh, and not, not uh, so much uh, registrations, let's say. Uh, but you can also do another thing as mentioned, you can run one large study, say you have uh, resources for hundred participants, you could do one study or you could do the same trick five times, yeah? 20 participants in each study. And that's actually a very efficient strategy. If your only goal is to get significance, you just run multiple small studies. The chance of finding something is much bigger, particularly when you go PHAC. And this is what, uh, what we found in the replication. So to be clear, the replication here is a meta replication. Huh? It's a replication of a study on replications in a special issue on replications dating from 2012 by the same, well, mostly the same research team, at least if it comes to me. Slight deviations, that's the difference in the lines that are very close, which is interesting. It cost, um, cost Amir quite a lot of time to uncover why that was the case, but it's actually some path dependency. And it's if you come to think of it and use a, a platform like SAM, you, you, which is modular, you, you notice immediately. So there's dependencies um, and very minor differences depending on how you implement. And then it also casts a lot of doubt on general conclusions based on simulations like this because they might, you know, setting it up a bit differently it might create completely different outcomes. So this is a true effect size, um, going in standardized mean difference going from zero to one. Um, and then the left-hand side, uh, what you see here is that um, um, the dashed lines represent the strategy of small studies. So instead of the one study of hundred participants, that's the full line, you run five of 20. And the chance, the mere chance of significant results, because you can compute that chance, obviously you don't need to simulate anything for that under the null, uh, is it much higher than it is for one single study. And so what you see here is on the left hand side that uh, it's actually a very, the dotted lines do much better up until 0.50 or so effect size. It's a winning strategy, particularly when you go PHAC using the tricks as simulated here. This is the winning strategy, but to explain why people do it. This, this obviously comes at a major cost in terms of estimation and bias, and that's on the right-hand side. So the effect size biases are massive in this scenario, which, which entails 20 participants in total, uh, 10 per cell, which is the N, uh, what the N means. So that's the problem, massive bias. Even if the effect is true, uh, you have a problem and not a small one either. Um, so that's what uh, Marianne found. Um, and I'm back, oops, sorry, too fast. And this is actually for different levels of N. But that's the um, that's in the paper. We replicated it, it was a nice uh, effort to do it um, to make sure that it works well. And then you, given that you've implemented it in a, in a vastly powerful machinery like SAM, you can easily uh, change anything. Uh, and this is of course what we wanted to do. Um, so massive bias winning strategy in these scenarios, at least with alpha of all five is running small studies, which might explain why they are so common in psychology uh, over this bigger studies. Although they're diminishing a bit uh, given the slow increase in sample size uh, that we see uh, in work by Mayon and others. So well, let's redefine uh, statistical significance, at least for the the first study in the field for novel discoveries, they said uh, Benjamin and his um, big group of co-authors, many of whom have well, familiar names. Um, and the, the, the question then is here, 
how does that change the, uh, the rules of the game, uh, as we call that uh, the title of the paper? How does it, does it still pay off to run small studies? Probably not. Um, and this is the same result uh, in three columns that you just found. So the right hand side is for alpha bar five. In the middle is the OO5 Benjamin and his colleagues recommended. And there, why not? Because you can, you know, add another level of alpha on the left hand side. And obviously, because it's modular, you can, you know, rerun this with all sorts of other types of inferential criteria, all sorts of other types of analysis. It's just child's play in a sense, except by some debugging sometimes, maybe. But uh, um, that's what you can do. So uh, lowering the alpha, what does it do? Well, that's uh, uh, statistics 101. It's, it lowers the chance of uh, uh, false positives. Huh? So that's uh, the, the left hand side, obviously of the chart here, the four effect sizes that are zero. And then as you go up, uh, of course the power is, is lower. So the chance of finding anything, even if you do a, the, the, the good thing, which is the fixed blue line here, it's a big study, it's not still that big, but at least and you do not uh, invoke any p-hacking power is very low and gets low, obviously, as you increase and uh, lower the alpha. Uh, but it's also very important to note that in the right hand side, you until 0.5 or so, we saw that the, uh, the small sample strategy was still effective, it was actually the winning strategy, just the higher one, particularly when the researchers are willing to be hacked. That's the green uh, dotted line on the, uh, on the top on the right. Uh, but it actually changed a lot uh, when you uh, uh, lower the alpha. So now it's actually the, the large uh, study strategy. So picking the 100 instead of the two, sorry, the five times 20, that is giving you more of an overall chance of finding an effect. So if that's the scenario, again, as simulated in these cases, then actually people would more often choose rather the big sample over the small one when the alpha is lower, which is actually good news because the bias still is massive. That, that in a way doesn't matter. It's, it's a function of the lack of power uh, across the board. So the power will be a bit lower uh, given the same sample size, obviously when the alpha gets uh, to become lower. And so the biases are ba basically the same, but instead of using the, the very nasty biased strategies on the upper right hand side, the dashed lines, which cause massive biases even for 40, so that's 40 times two, 80 participants per cell, which for experimental psychology is big. It's much bigger than the average. The massive values that you see for the small sample strategy would be lower to the lower thresholds. Uh, so the, 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 the large sample studies would be maybe become more common, which is a good side effect. It's, the bias is still remaining. It's a bit higher actually even there. Although, uh, yeah, if you uh, be hack, then might become a bit less, huh? it's a power booster. So that's interesting, but anyway. So this is what, what you could do, but also you could expand this. Huh? So this is also a more aggressive form of p-hacking and, and there's you know so many different ways to p-hack. And we don't, we have no idea what people do. It would be good to keep track, you know, in a random sample of uh, studies unregistered of all the analysis that have been done and then do some cool analysis of that just to see what people actually do. But we don't, I'm not familiar with that type of study. So this is just uh, another way of doing the optional stopping. I don't expect that to do much, but that's uh, the topic of Esther's talk after this. Um, removing outliers uh, while you change the K, which is the threshold for what you call a, a, uh, an outlier here. We call that subjective K, not a paper on outlier deletion and bias. Uh, so that's a really aggressive way. You just to lower the threshold of what is an outlier until you find something significant. And if you do that, um, you know, you get bias because that, that, that pays off. But it, it uh, enters in the sphere of more than a bit questionable, I think, in terms of integrity, it's really bad. And most, if, if you report that truthfully, most researchers would say, what the hell, why do you exclude an outlier with a Z value of 1.6? It doesn't make any sense. Eh? Okay. So to wrap up, uh, the first one I'm not going to repeat. We didn't have to do any um, simulation for that. <laughs> that low in alpha lowers the false positive range, which according to Benjamin and all, obviously has some nice uh, positive effects on the uh, 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 
uh, positive predicted value among others, and hence probably also in replicability. But that's also a very major point of discussion that we've seen. But the nice thing, that's the good news in green, that yeah, the, the running of small studies with such a higher level uh, of, of evidence with alpha of lower than L5 actually increases, demands even the, the p-hackers to use bigger samples. So that's the good news. The biases will remain for larger studies, will actually increase here and there, but given that, you, that you would, you're forced to have a bigger sample, unless you do very aggressive p-hacking as is shown in this slide here, but that's just weird. Eh? You, you see pattern is also going up as, you, as the two effect size goes up. It's, it's weirder than uh, in life. So the biases are not going to go away, but there might be something to it, I would say. Now, this is just all contingent on this simulation. We just picked what uh, Marianne did. We added a couple of things to that. And that's also the main point of discussion. So do I dare you know, to make general statements and recommendations as did uh, Benjamin and all uh, people? Um, well, not at this point. I would say more work is needed because there's so many different things uh, that, you, that play a role. So this is a particular scenario, but you, you also have to take into account resources, the, the incentive structure where finding a novel effect pays, you know, pays off typically in the grant scheme and in, in, in uh, recognitions and rewards. And in such a competitive environment, you know, there might also be all sorts of dependencies that I, I can't immediately see that might also play a role. At the same time, it's also nice to know, and that's what I like about the sentiment, is that you put the burden of proof on original offers. They also get have most to win in terms of running big samples. And I think big samples are always better, so hooray for that. But much more modeling is needed. And that's you know what you can do with Sam, so that's the future. And hopefully uh, next year or the year after that, we'll present some more work with Sam uh, on this. So this is the Meta Group and the funder that made uh, you know, the money uh, gave us the money and the uh, link to the uh, uh, Sam paper, the first pre-print. Uh, pre uh, Thank you. Thank you, Yalta. Um, we have time to answer, I think, yeah, one quick question. There is a question I saw in the Q&A from Gilbert already. He asked a question. Um, the recent publications um, suggest that indeed we um, lower that p-value threshold uh, from 0.05 to 0.005. Um, they modeled their calculations with 0.005 to understand how it might impact the scientific process. Uh, false positives will be reduced drastically, but the total resource consumption will rise. And then, yeah, um, yeah they ask, what do you suggest, basically? Yeah, yeah so that's a good point. Huh? So you, you have to think, and that's that's not typical in these types of scenarios. And uh, we all recognize this as, a meta, as meta researchers that there's there's elements to this related to getting resources, you can model it as uh, some have done, you know, in, in a particular framework. Um, but it is important to do that, um, you know, to see how, you know, these behaviors are affected by resources and collaboration networks, even going beyond individual researchers, which, you know, makes it even more complex. So um, you can, I, I'm pretty sure you can um, create very cool, um, uh, scenarios and, and contact and research questions in that uh, regard. And so it's really, yeah, it's, it's still, you know, you have to build modules for that as well. So it's still not, not ready, but you can, you can do that there. So that's the cool thing. I'll also uh, address this issue, I think, uh, in the discussion uh, section. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Yalta. Okay, um, I'm going to set up uh, my presentation real quick. Um, you should be able to see it right now. I'm having my, some difficulties, technical difficulties, but um, if it's not visible, I would gladly hear it. Looks okay. Okay, then it's great. Then I'm just gonna start. Okay. Um, thanks to the previous speakers. Um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be part of the symposium as a speaker as well. I'm uh, going to give a talk um, that shows basically the results of a simulation study uh, performed in SAM. We investigated the effect of uh, multiple questionable research practices on the uh, meta-analytic pooled estimate and heterogeneity estimates. And I'm going to um, keep my introduction very, very short. Our uh, study is heavily inspired by the 
I can say, famous articles investigating the uh, self-admission rate of engaging in questionable research practices among American, Italian, and German psychologists. And our first aim with Sam was to investigate most of these QRPs um, separately. And um, as Yalta already mentioned from previous research, we also know that the effects of publication bias can be quite detrimental. Uh, bias through the use of questionable research practices should be smaller than the bias of publication bias. Uh, we are interested in finding out uh, which QRPs are more detrimental than others. So in this study, uh, which is pre-registered at the link you see below, uh, we were interested in the effect of five different QRPs on the uh, meta-analytic effect size estimate and heterogeneity estimates. Uh, we also check p-value distributions of the individual effect sizes to see whether there might be a bump uh, below 0.05, but um, these results are not included in this presentation due to uh, time constraints. We also varied um, some factors across all conditions. We uh, varied the true effect size by five levels. We chose these mean differences because they are the thresholds, um, the standards used by Cohen, and the 0.35 estimate is commonly found as a median effect size in psychological meta-analyses. Uh, based on these effect sizes, we calculated the required sample size with a power of 0.80. We derived the true heterogeneity estimates uh, from a previous study of psychological meta-analyses, and finally we varied the number of studies by 5, 25, and 125. Uh, before I show you results, I'm going to give you a quick overview of how these QRPs work, what they are, and what the process behind them is. So, uh, naturally, we will have a, a baseline condition of no QRPs, in which we have two groups and one uh, dependent variable. And uh, we conduct a t-test between these two groups. And um, from that, from that t-test, we will get a mean estimate, a p-value, and we will include this effect um, in the meta-analysis, regardless of its outcome, regardless of significance. Our first uh, QRP is optional stopping, uh, for which we have two levels. This is the moderate level. We again have two groups and one dependent variable, and we perform a t-test and we include the effect in a meta-analysis if the effect is significant and positive. So positive means in a direction that we expect it. If this is not the case, in the moderate case of optional stopping, we add five people per group, so 10 in total, and uh, we test again. If we do not find a significant effect and a positive result, we add some more. And then again, if we fail, we add another round. We do this for three rounds max or until we have a, a positive significant effect. And um, at the end of the three rounds, the effect that we have with the larger sample size is added to the meta-analysis. Then uh, we also have an extreme optional stopping case. Uh, here we again first test on our original sample like this. And uh, if we do not find a significant and positive effect, we add 15 people per group. So that's quite some more than the previous one, making 30 in total. And we do that for three rounds, uh, or we stop uh, once a significant and positive effect is found. At the end of the three rounds, we include the effect that we have in the new sample. Then our second QRP is sec um, selective outcome reporting, which is also known as outcome switching, um, and which has a large uh, admittance rate uh, between 40 and 70%, I believe, in the studies that I just mentioned. Here again, we have two groups but now we have four dependent variables instead of one. Uh, please note here also that the true effect size um, is the same across the outcomes, uh, and the outcomes are correlated at 0.40. Uh, we want to emulate a researcher who tests multiple outcomes and then takes the first significant outcome that they find and discards the rest. But because Sam simulates all results at the same time, what we do is we um, check all of them, uh, we check which of the effects are significant and positive, and of all of those, we chose one randomly. So that means that it's not necessarily always the one with the lowest p-value. This is the way that we um, try to uh, simulate the first selective out um, first significant outcome. Then the more extreme version of selective outcome reporting, where we have two groups and four DVs, like before, uh, we test all four. And then uh, we do pick the maximum one, the one with the lowest p-value. 
and we discard the rest. This one gets included in the meta-analysis. Outlier removal also has two levels, moderate and extreme. Uh, we have two groups and one dependent variable again, and we select the effect if it is significant and positive. If we do not find such an effect, we want to identify and delete outliers from the sample. So in the moderate level of outlier removal, we delete observations that have a z-score smaller than minus, uh, minus 2.5 and larger than 2.5, uh, which corresponds to the 99% confidence interval for the mean. So these people drop out, we test again and include the effect in the meta-analysis. Then in the extreme outlier removal condition, we identify outliers that have a z-score smaller than um, minus two and a half in the treatment group and a z-score larger than two and a half in the control group, uh, meaning that we're more selective in, in who we throw out and we create a bigger distance between the groups. We drop these people out, we perform a t-test and we include the effect in the meta-analysis. Then our multiple condition uh, QRP has three groups or three conditions. Uh, that I would like to call control, treatment one, and treatment two. Uh, again, one dependent variable with the same true effect size across these groups. And uh, we first test control versus treatment one, and basically we pretend treatment two does not exist. Then if this does not give us a significant positive effect, we do the same thing, but then we test control versus treatment two. Then finally, if that also does not work, we combine the two treatment groups together and test that big treatment group against the control group. If that does not give us a significant and positive effect, we select out of these three effects, uh, the one with the smallest p-value. That is the one that gets included in the meta-analysis. Then our final QRP is optional dropping. Optional dropping is also called a subgroup analysis. And here, what we wanted to do is we wanted to simulate a practice where um, participants get dropped out of the study based on the score that they have on another variable. So for example, gender. Um, if we find a non-significant effect for the whole group, as you see here, then we do subgroup analysis to find a significant effect. We simulated this in such a way that 50% of the sample has a score of zero and 50% of the sample has a score of one on the dummies. So we would first perform a t-test for the entire group. And if that one is not significant, uh, we would test the effect on the first subgroup and drop the other half out. And if that doesn't work, then the other subgroup, of course. We do this. Um, if this doesn't work, we select the second dummy and drop half out or the other half. And finally, we would do the same, of course, for dummy number three. Um, if at the end we would not have found a significant effect, we select the one with the smallest p-value from these seven tests. Okay, those were the QRPs. Uh, I'm now going to show you the results. The results are quite similar uh, over all number of studies on the meta-analysis, so I'm only showing you the K is 25 condition, which means uh, the meta-analyses consist of 25 studies. Um, because you can do so much with Sam, uh, I've collected many results and there are many different things um, that are interesting to discuss, but I will only show a few. In a minute, I'm going to show you a larger graph with many grids, but to get accustomed to the graph, here is just one with um, a smaller um, example. So what we see here in the columns is uh, two types of QRPs, selective outcome reporting, uh, first significant effect, selective outcome reporting, um, max or most significant effect. On the rows, we see the results for the between study heterogeneity, 0 and 0.01. And then within one plot, you see here the true effect size uh, on the x-axis and the y-axis always contains the bias. And in this case, it's the individual um, level effect size bias that we're interested in. And uh, of course, the lines represent the um, different sample sizes per group. So we see for selective outcome recording first, so this column, that uh, the bias decreases as true effect size increases. And this makes sense, I guess, right? Because power increases in effect size and in sample size. And we also see across the rows here that bias increases as heterogeneity increases. 
In contrast, the um, selective outcome reporting max um, has a larger amount of bias overall, and the bias stays almost constant across levels of the true effect size. Uh, of course, the bias is largest um, for the smaller sample sizes. And um, similarly here also the bias increases across um, tau squared. And as you can see, the bias is quite substantial, eh? even uh, especially with the uh, small sample sizes. So this is an example for two QRPs and two levels of tau. These are our complete results. Uh, again, in the columns, we see the QRPs. Uh, the rows are the tau squared values. And within each plot, the x-axis is still the true effect size and the y-axis is the individual level bias. Um, here we see the same result, right? So for most QRPs, the bias decreases as the sample size increases. You see that in the difference of the lines here. Um, it decreases in D. Um, so as effect size rises, the um, bias goes down for most of them, I should say. Um, the bias also increases in the amount of heterogeneity. So in that sense, um, the results are pretty consistent. Specifically, the two um, versions of selective outcome reporting and optional dropping have large biasing effects. And a side note I should make here is that with optional dropping, um, if we have not found a significant effect across all comparisons, we chose the uh, smallest p-value, right? So this means that the optional dropping step actually contains the extreme form of selective outcome reporting at the end. And that may explain um, the large biasing effect that we see here. And this is also the case for the multiple condition one. Here, the bias is also um, quite large. And here, of course, at the end, we also select that final, um, the p-value that is um, smallest. Optional stopping has a uh, small effect overall for both versions. Um, and like Yalta says, this result makes sense uh, and because we keep sampling until we have just found significance, uh, meaning that the effect size will be inflated, but uh, not so much. But what was surprising to me, uh, specifically in context of the previous talk, is that the outlier conditions have such small amounts of bias. Um, it could be that our Z value was too large and that changing this value um, might give um, different results. It's probably the case. Um, so maybe we should uh, choose a lower threshold here to investigate that effect, because there have been studies, as you have seen, right, that found a significant impact of outlier removal. So uh, we have to investigate this further. Okay, next we're going to see the same results as we see now, but now on the meta-analysis level. So the bias we're going to see is the bias in the meta-analytic estimate. So here we see the results of these um, individual effect sizes being put in the meta-analysis. Uh, the results are very similar to the previous one. I'm going to go back to the previous slide and then back to this one. As you can see, they're quite similar, right? Uh, the conditions where selective reporting in any form takes place uh, has the largest uh, biasing effect. Uh, and what is clear from these results is that the peaks of the bias uh, seem to be around common effect sizes and common sample sizes in psychology, uh, which I think is quite problematic. Uh, let me see. In the interest of time, I'm going to show you the final result, the effect uh, of QRPs on the tau squared estimate in meta-analysis. Um, we are looking at the same graph. It's constructed the same way, but now the y-axis here is the tau bias. And as you see on the top of these graphs, there is a zero bias. Uh, we are also looking only at the results of 25 studies in the meta-analysis. Uh, here I should note that the results uh, for five studies are a bit more pronounced than this, um, as are the results of the 125 studies are a bit less pronounced. And this is quite problematic, right, that these uh, results for the five studies are more pronounced because um, the median number of studies in psychological meta-analyses is found to be somewhere, I think, between six and 19. Um, so yeah, that's uh, again quite problematic. The main uh, takeaway message that I have here is that QRPs in general underestimate the amount of between study heterogeneity. Um, this effect is quite negligible for uh, small amounts of heterogeneity, as you can see in these two rows. Uh, however, once there is quite some heterogeneity, the underestimations become quite severe for all QRPs, um, except again, outlier removal, uh, which we have to investigate. Interesting to see here is that optional stopping, which did not have much effect 
on the individual effect size level and meta-analysis level has quite some effect on the heterogeneity estimate when heterogeneity is uh, large enough, so these quadrants. Uh, and this is problematic because not only do QRPs underestimate heterogeneity, publication bias does as well. Uh, my colleague Hilde Augustijn has done work on this, and especially for small effect sizes, and when there is a lot of heterogeneity, uh, the between-study heterogeneity can be severely underestimated. Um, problematic because I think it's reasonable to assume that individual studies can be p-hacked and that there is publication bias on top, right? These studies then end up in a meta-analysis, and it's very hard to estimate the uh, heterogeneity in a population uh, given these results, given this data. So, a short summary of the important findings. It is clear, right? Um, selective outcome reporting and its variants are most detrimental. Um, and those variants are multiple conditions and optional dropping. Uh, optional stopping has a minimal effect, and this result is in line with previous studies, um, which again makes sense because you select studies just below the significance threshold. Uh, however, this is not an argument in favor of implementing optional stopping in your research, of course, because we have seen uh, that it can be quite detrimental uh, for heterogeneity estimates. It was surprising to see that outlier removal didn't do much, uh, which is not in line with previous research done, so we have to check that. And finally, QRPs generally overestimate effect size and meta-analytic effect size, but underestimate heterogeneity. And um, this is in line in, with what publication bias does, so that combination uh, is uh, pretty worrying, I would say. Then what's next? I'm not finished with interpreting all the results that Sam produced. So I still wanna look at p-value distributions. I wanna investigate the QRPs that we used. So changing the z-score in the outlier removal case um, or choosing an alternative way to select that final effect size in the uh, multiple condition and optional dropping scenarios. Uh, of course, this study only looked at the effect of individual QRPs separately, and I think it's reasonable to assume that QRPs can be combined in one study. It's also reasonable to assume that publication bias exists on top of QRPs. I just saw in the presentation of Amir that there are other QRPs that I can investigate as well, such as rounding a p-value uh, to 0.04 instead of 0.05. We could investigate uh, the effect of publication bias tests. Uh, yeah, like I said, the possibilities are endless for now. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts uh, and suggestions uh, as well. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, attention. Let me check the chat real quick, if there's anything. Oh, I see the time, okay. Uh, if there are questions, I'm gonna answer them uh, in the Q&A uh, by text. Uh, also feel free to contact me or any of the other presenters if we are running out of time and you still have questions to ask. I'm gonna um, give the floor to uh, Professor Erik Jan Wagenmakers, who is gonna be the discussant for our session. Uh, please take it away, Erik Jan. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, all the presenters for uh, thought provoking and uh, I think depressingly uh, realistic uh, perspectives on the scientific process. Um, so, uh, I'd like to start by just some uh, some uh, very general uh, uh, observations. So we actually do not have that much time, right? Uh, the session is another 10 minutes. OK, that's great. Um, yeah, and I don't intend to just uh, have a monologue of uh, 10 minutes. I don't think that's my uh, that's my role here. But I do want to say that recently there's been some debate about the value of pre-registration in particular. And I, um, I think uh, critics of pre-registration should really watch this session. And uh, if you watch this session and then still argue that it has no use, I don't, I don't really um, understand how that could happen. But you know, the, the, the thing is, and Yelta mentioned the confirmation bias and it's very strong. And it also means that you're all the time on the lookout for information that confirms your prior beliefs. So uh, I doubt that many people who uh, argue against pre-registration would even attend uh, a, a session like this one. And maybe that's also part of the problem that we, we base our arguments on different uh, sources of information. So um, I also think it's interesting uh, uh, how this, how can you can wonder, how can this happen, right? So, so obviously uh, some people, uh, you know, especially people who, who, who just fake their data, they're 
they know what they're doing. But I think a large number of people who engage in these, uh, uh, these practices um, don't do it intentionally. I think a lot of it happens unwittingly. Uh, as Yelt already uh, said, you know, the example where you think you've pre-registered something because it seems so obvious, it's in hindsight, uh, a lot of things uh, seem obvious. So, and Michael Shermer actually uh, addressed a similar point. He, he's, he, uh, um, he asked the question, why do smart people believe weird things? Oh, uh, uh, one second. I have a four-year-old son who just uh, walked in, uh, uh, only one year younger than Yelta's son, but uh, just as loud, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so Michael Shermer argued that uh, uh, smart people believe weird things because they're so good at finding arguments uh, uh, why their beliefs shouldn't be challenged. And I think it's exactly the same way in the scientific process, where if you, uh, if you uh, come up with a particular analysis strategy and it yields the result that you think should be the right result, um, but you feel validated and uh, you feel that it's obvious that, that, that your choices were not ad hoc, were not uh, uh, chosen specifically to achieve that result, but were entirely reasonable. So I think that's, that's, uh, uh, th that, that's a big problem with people being uh, sometimes uh, uh, a bit too smart. And in general, I would also say, uh, particularly uh, uh, before the whole replication crisis happened, you, you had certain labs that really applied what was called at that time, sort of uh, when nobody was, uh, was listening, was called the shotgun approach to science, right? Where you have your experiment and you think like, what conditions should I include in my experiment? And you basically overload your experiment with conditions. And then you, you shoot this shotgun and you look at the wall and you see what, what's stuck, right? And, um, and obviously, if you combine that with hindsight bias and confirmation bias, then it's a, I think it's a recipe for disaster. So uh, I have a few, I, I, I do want to say something about those p-values. Uh, because there was actually an interesting question and a response to that with a link to the paper by uh, Gilbert Schoenfelder. And uh, he also referred to this paper. So I thought this is interesting. I'm, I'm going to look it up. And it turns out I was the editor for that, uh, for that paper. So <laughs> that, was, uh, that was funny. But I will say one more thing about, and I think it relates to, to something that uh, Esther was saying with meta-analyses, right? So one uh, additional uh, QPR that often comes into play with meta-analyses is uh, when you add covariates or do subgroup analyses. And I had to think of a, a meta-analysis I was involved in and it was pre-registered and, and nothing was statistically significant. But, you know, out of the uh, 17 studies, nine showed a positive effect and eight showed a negative effect. And so one of the reviewers who was a proponent of this particular finding argued that what is really important here is to investigate why those nine studies showed a positive effect. Uh, so what separates the successes from the failures, right? And of course, there was not just nothing going on in those 17 studies, but it does show you the, the, the desire that some people have to, uh, to see the effect in their data. So, um, so, uh, and I, I did like the, um, uh, so, so I thought it, I, I really thought part of it was depressing. You know, I always have to fight through these talks a little bit because, you know, it's just so all these Q, these questionable research practices, it's just, it's so terrible. But I do think it's really nice to study it systematically and just rub people's noses in it and really show how detrimental these, these practices are. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I just want to say one more thing about those p-values, and then I think we should just uh, uh, hear from the presenters again. Um, so uh, I was actually a co-author on that paper on uh, proposing to lower the p-value to 0 0.005. And it is actually, when you read that paper, we were actually extremely careful. It should only be done for new discoveries. And, and I, I disagree, actually, that it should only be done for new discoveries. So it was a little bit too meek. Uh, for my uh, taste, but I also think it's important to evaluate, to, to realize what motivated that proposal. And what motivated that proposal is, if you look at 
p values close to the 0.05 boundary, evidentially they mean almost nothing because the data are just as likely under the null hypothesis as under the alternative hypothesis. So the problem arises here because what you're trying to do when you use the usual a p-value significance test is make a discrete yes no decision and when you have very ambiguous data right i think what people should do is they should be forced to make a yes no decision on ambiguous data they should just say these data are ambiguous right so everything lower than 0.005 for usual sample sizes would be good evidence that there is something going on everything well you know, the problem, of course, is how do you assess evidence in favor of absence? Obviously, the Bayesian approach would be the way to go here, but uh, those p-values lower than 0.05, but higher than 0.005, usually it would just warrant the conclusion, we don't have enough information to make a confident claim. Right? So really, I think there's a lot to be said for somehow moving to a situation where uh, you in include the category, we don't know enough to make a decision. I don't think any scientist should be forced to make a yes, no decision in the situation where the evidence is ambiguous. Okay, so that's my opinion on that. Um, so overall, I think it was uh, uh, really wonderful. I think this is excellent material to convince uh, people that, uh, that the methods we are looking at uh, uh, or, or, or that we should resort to methods such as pre-registration, such as a multiverse analysis. But what I was uh, actually missing a little bit was a multi-analyst uh, approach. Because I, I, I have the feeling that you, if you only look at the multiverse, you're still massively underestimating the uncertainty, right? Because if you have a single analysis pipeline, um, uh, and a lot of research has shown now that that there's if you if you ask 30 scientists to 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 do an analysis you'll get 30 different analysis pipelines and in in work like fmri it's uh, it's it's even more uh more variable and you'll get a lot of uh, different outcomes there as well so i think we move to a situation where we where we uh pay more uh attention just not just to the multiverse, but also use a multi-analyst approach. And it's all gonna take a lot more time and effort and resources, but I think it's the only way forward ultimately. So um, yeah, that was still a lot of uh, a long monologue, but I think I'm just gonna stop here and see if anybody has uh, anything to add. Looking at the other panelists, the, uh, it's indeed the case that's actually in moral decision-making, they have these paradigms where they let uh, the participants lie in circumstances. It is all white lies, huh? um, in circumstances that they cannot be checked. Huh? So it's actually also there are some research suggesting that more intelligent, more creative people lie more because they just justify better. Because I'm actually, I'm actually uh, completely uh, in agreement with you that this is a problem to smart people, to creative people can you know, convince themselves very easily. Um, and indeed we need to, yeah, let people know uh, the biases involved. And it's, uh, yeah, it all goes back to uh, the law of, belief in the law of small numbers and, you know, the complete um, failure, even among statisticians to understand something or, or to have a good assessment of it. It's not the, the, the intuition is so far off for most people, even if you, you have to compute the stuff, right? So I, I actually, I, I really want to uh, uh, support what you're saying here, because I think particular when, in particular, when you look at statisticians and even a methodologist, if you look what is generally published in, say, psychological methods, for, for me, to me, it's uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, right? Because it's like another little tweak on the ANOVA and how you compute degrees of freedom in an unbalanced this and that and the other thing. And it has no consequence whatsoever in the presence of these, this huge bias and this huge lack of transparency. So it's really, uh, the, I think uh, uh, there's an elephant in the room here and uh, a lot of people, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether they're even aware of it, right? Because as statisticians and methodologists, you are really in this ivory tower where you can pretend that, you know, balls are drawn from urns and coins are tossed <laughs> an infinite number of times. And that's just not what happens in the real world. No, I'm afraid so. 
Um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to wrap it up. Um, we are out of time. Uh, thanks to, uh, of course, uh, everyone, uh, the panelists here. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Professor Egyan, thank you for your discussion. Uh, thanks for the participants, of course. If you want any, um, if you want to discuss with us further, uh, there was a link in the chat just now in the Reno chat. We are, of course, uh, also uh, readily, to, easily to find on the internet uh, if you want to contact us. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks very much to all the panel. We're going to wrap up this session now. We'll be ending the webinar. I've put the link in the chat to the Remo networking platform and the link to the MetaScience 2021 website. So you can find more information about all the sessions, uh, about the speakers, and also to the Slack channel if you want to carry on these interactions and engagements through the future. The next session will be starting at 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 5 p.m. UK time. And it is on the uptake of pre-registration. So I think really Really topical for what all the panelists have been talking about today and this may be my own confirmation bias speaking but I think it's going to be an excellent session so thanks to everyone for listening thanks to all the panelists and uh, thanks for attending MetaScience 2021. Thanks Sarah. Bye.